this is the first large sculpture that I ever did. It was a challenge, it was intimidating. I photographed as many elephants as I could, but I came back to Pedos because that was, you know, it was in there. Very strong. Uh, when I first got in the cage, there were three elephants. And just like with the dogs, I said, let me smell you first to get used to you. Because I wanted to feel their bones and their muscles, and I wanted to draw them and sculpt them. So I stood in the middle, around the three, and the three came over to me, and they started at my shoes, with like three vacuum cleaners, and they sucked. Oh, I'm very worried about what might happen to it, because I don't want to see it destroyed. It was made for children. I'm very happy that the present owner wants it to be out there. He wants people to experience it, and especially children. I'm uh, hoping they'll have another, the life, this life will continue, it won't end here. I think we should save the elephants, and uh, in general, too. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Sal, and I'd like to welcome you all to Phase 3 of the Expedition Log series. In this 40th episode, we will be revisiting the Burlington Center Mall in Burlington Township, New Jersey. In January of 2019, I got the opportunity to film this mall with permission from the owners while conducting an interview on behalf of Pete Blackbird, Jack Thomas, and Brian Florence at deadmalls.com for their website. The interview is with the Tokyo Broadcasting System on the downfall of the American Shopping Mall. This episode is incredibly special to me, not only because I received permission for unrestricted access to the entire mall, but also because I was granted some alone time with Petal the Elephant during her last moments, alone in this cold, lonely, shuttered mall. So come take a walk with me and my trusty sidekick Anthony from Faded Commerce as we tour the Burlington Center Mall one last time. But first, a word from our sponsor. Actor Jonathan Frid in role as Barnabas Collins from the incredibly campy and often botched live sitcom from the late 1960s, Dark Shadows, selling his brand new board game by Milton Bradley. This is Barnabas Collins. He lives in a strange world, a world of vampires, werewolves, and Dark Shadows. Now the world of Dark Shadows is yours in a strange new game by Milton Bradley, the Barnabas Collins Dark Shadows game. Each player spins, then selects bones from the coffin. But watch out for the dreaded stake. You struggle to complete a skeleton, a skeleton that glows in the dark. If you win, the curse of the vampire is yours. Mm -hmm. With the game, you get a set of Barnabas fangs. Milton Bradley makes the best games in the world. And the Barnabas Collins game is the scariest. So get it. The year is 1982, and Jim Rouse is about to open a brand new mall in New Jersey. This mall will be in direct competition from two already established and well-to-do local malls. Jim Rouse himself opened the Cherry Hill Mall in 1961, which was designed by the famed architect Victor Gruen. Burlington would open just minutes away. The Moorestown Mall opened in 1963, and Burlington would open just 15 minutes away. Both Cherry Hill and Moorestown underwent several renovations over the years, always keeping them current, attractive, and modern with comfortable amenities, catering to the changing wants and needs of retail culture. If you listen very closely here, you'll hear some sort of alarm. But to me, it sort of sounds like somebody pulled the power cord to a life support machine and the patient's actually coding. It sounds like you're hearing this mall actually dying. The first time that I came to this mall, I didn't spend much time around the perimeter of it. 
and I really didn't give it much thought, but when I came back a few times afterwards, I couldn't help but notice all of the birds singing. And then when you look at the actual facade of this mall, their chosen logo is a bird. And I wonder if Jim Rouse actually used the singing of the birds in the natural habitat to design what became the Burlington bird. Listen to their music. It's gorgeous. And how about that Sears label scar? We're going to revisit that Sears later because we actually find an active water main break at this mall as I was trying to conduct my interview, but that comes a bit later in the episode, so stick around for that. We're currently looking at the outer facing entrance to the Strawbridge and Clothier, which was an original anchor here, and that later became a Macy's. But they did retain a lot of the original visuals that were installed with the Strawbridge, like that seal up there. That's the original Strawbridge's seal. This never got renovated, which is a trend for this mall. Nothing was ever renovated. So the way that you see this mall today, this is exactly as it was in 1980. This stairwell was just so creepy to me and all of the stairs were rotted out, so I couldn't go up there. I couldn't get up those stairs. If you watch very closely, you'll see a bee coming in from the right side of the screen. It almost killed me. And before we get into the mall, I just wanted to take a glimpse at this giant transformer or whatever it is out here. Because you can hear this permeating in the mall and I don't think that the sound got through on the footage. So at this point, we will get inside the mall. And again, I was here with permission. The year was 1982. Advanced home computer technology was just starting to capture the hearts of people around the world. In 1982, the Time Magazine Person of the Year was none other than the computer. In 1982, the first CD player was sold in Japan. Michael Jackson released his second solo album, Thriller. At Carnegie Mellon University, computer scientist Scott Fallman suggested the use of a colon, hyphen, and left-facing parenthesis as a way of expressing emotion in an email. In theaters, we had movies premiere such as Porky's, Poltergeist, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Rocky III, and Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. The Weather Channel aired on cable television for the first time in 1982 as well. The United States was in the midst of an awful, awful recession, with certain areas of the country hitting nearly 25% unemployment. 
The recession peaked in November and December of 1982, with a nationwide average of unemployment hitting 10.8%, which was the highest since the Great Depression of the 1930s. In my opinion, it might not have been the best time for Jim Rouse to open a mall in direct competition with two larger, already established malls. All those receipts are from the shady massage parlor. That's a lot of receipts. So we're inside this abandoned storefront now, and I'm not sure what it used to be, but as we get towards the back, you're going to start seeing some Christmas decoration. And it's always so sad to me to see abandoned storefronts, including Christmas decorations, that I know will never be used in that mall again. But I am hopeful for them, because I learned that all of the Christmas decorations that were used at the Schuylkill Mall in Frackville, Pennsylvania, which you can see in X-Logs 10 and 21, the decorations that were used at Schuylkill have been removed and are now being used at the South Mall in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I'm definitely going to have to head out there and see the old Schuylkill decorations, possibly for a special Christmas episode, so stay tuned. Look at the dead plants billowing in the drafty cold mall. There was a huge draft that day, so it was super cold. And I had on like four layers, under armor, shirt, light jacket, and a pea coat. So this mall was built in 1982 on a 41.7 acre tract of land. The original anchors were Strawbridge and Clothier and Sears. Right now, however, we're walking toward the third anchor, which Rouse added in 1996 and was a JC Penney. 
the JCPenney would shutter in 2014 after a failed redevelopment plan. As it sits, it's in pretty rough shape. We didn't get inside. I wasn't interested in doing it. We could have, but it was dark and you wouldn't have seen much. Look closely. Do you see any organisms with independent motility in there? Do you know how many drops of water from the ceiling it took to fill that entire bucket? And how much time it took to grow that algae? That bucket is not new. Neither is that water. Here you can see the famous Moonbeam Capital Investment LLC banners for fun, fashion, and dining. None of which occur in this mall, nor have occurred in quite some time in tandem. We'll get to Moonbeam later. Just three years after the J.C. Penney opened in 1996, Rouse sold the mall for 10.5 million bucks to Jaeger Management in 1999. Even when I was here the last time, when it was still open, the mall wasn't vibrant. There were stores open, and there were people shopping, but nothing about this mall ever felt vital. It never felt like it was a community hub. In all the malls I've been to, there are a few that stick out, like the Swansea Mall. I was there right before it closed, even until those last few moments. You can hear people buzzing, desperately trying to show the mall owners that they wanted their mall to survive. But Burlington, it came in with fire and vigor and with a lot of anticipation, but the mall just died with a whimper. So the reason I was at this mall was I was giving an interview to the Tokyo Broadcasting System for deadmalls.com because Jack called me. He said that neither he nor Brian could make it. So he asked if I would stand in and do the interview. It did air somewhere in Japan, but I can't find it.
The question that they were asking me mainly was, why are malls failing? Why are we seeing so many dead malls? So what did kill the non-super regional suburban rural mall? Was it Amazon.com? Was it the internet? These are the two places that everybody in my comment section always go to. When you guys look at these videos, your first thought is, Amazon killed them all. No, that's not true. The reason we're losing so many of these malls today is because of an aggressive overexpansion of malls during the 80s and 90s. When given the choice, mainstream shoppers will go to the mall with the most lavish amenities, choices, and safety. Why would you ever go to a mall with subpar stores? Because it's close? It's possible. But before the great mall expansion in the late 20th century, people had, quote, their mall, their local mall. But they didn't think of it like this. They think of it like that now. But back then, they just didn't have any options. So they just visited that mall because it was there. Then they got options. They got choices. And soon they were presented with the option of the old mall with terrible stores and dated amenities. Or the new mall, which might be a little bit further, but may have that thing that they're really looking for. Wouldn't you travel a bit further if it meant you could find what you were looking for and purchase it today and have it in your hands today? Recently, I had to purchase a new tuxedo, and the tuxedo needed to be a tailcoat. So I visited all of my local malls, down from DC all the way up to Southern Pennsylvania. I was only able to find what I was looking for at the Towson Town Center, but even then at the men's warehouse, they were trying to tell me that tails were out of style and that nobody needed them anymore, so therefore you couldn't purchase them. And this guy was talking down to me, trying to tell me that I shouldn't buy them. I play concerts a lot. And most of the concerts I play, I need a tailcoat. So I needed to purchase these things. I can't rent them each time I play a concert. That's ridiculous. So I looked around, I went everywhere. White Marsh, Westminster, Dundalk, Gaithersburg, Tyson's, even down to Fairfax, nobody would sell me tails. So I jumped onto the internet and I found a wonderful website, dobell.com. They're from London. I purchased tails from them because they were selling tails. It was done. I got two day shipping and I did it in about 10 minutes and I never left my studio. Is this the thing that killed malls? That convenience of buying something like that? No, it's not. Did it contribute to the downfall of malls? No, but it's the thing that's taking advantage of the downfall of the overabundance of way, way, way too many malls that are now scaling back because they think people should have a certain thing. And these specialty stores are trying to decide what consumers need. And because they're limiting the choices that they give people, they think people don't need tails anymore, so they're not going to sell them. It's forcing consumers who need something special to find it somewhere else. And it just so happens that that place is the internet.
In 2006, when I was in college, I was driving around this busted 1994 Dodge Shadow. I loved that car. It actually used to be my grandmother's and she called it Emily. When she gave it to me, it only had like 5,000 miles on it because she only drove it to and from work and her work was only a couple of miles away. So the car was in pristine condition, but I just beat the hell out of it. But at the time, I could have gone to Crystal City. I could have gone to Landmark. I could have gone to Tyson's because I was at school in Washington, DC. But I was also learning about Amazon because as I was going to these malls, I couldn't really get what I needed because I was a music major. I needed certain outfits. I needed books for this. I needed a music shop. I needed a luthier to get my instrument repaired, which was specialty and I had that. But even at the luthier, he couldn't provide to me some of the stuff that the internet was selling. I could go online and get anything my heart desired because the competing malls and shops in my area, they couldn't get it together. They weren't willing to get it together. They weren't willing to find alternate methods to sell to consumers. Special order is something that I think they should have done a lot earlier than they do it now. Price matching is something I think they should have done a heck of a lot earlier than they did it. You see, back in the 1980s, people had no choice but to purchase things from a mall or some mom and pop shop or a downtown boutique if they wanted tons of options. Mall developers and owners took advantage of this and everyone wanted to reap the rewards of the limited availability of malls. The problem was though, that everyone was taking advantage and was contributing to the issue. One mall made two, two malls made four, four malls made eight, and eventually as we approached the millennium, the US was so over mauled Too many malls were around, giving people too many choices, confusing them, not knowing what was at each of these malls. And it would make a lot of them say, you know what, I don't know where I want to go, so I'm just going to do some research online and figure out what I want, and then go get it at the mall. This research brought them to the fledgling Amazon and eBay and all of the other sites that are now titans in the online consumer industry. Over time, Amazon began selling more than just books, obviously, and Elon Musk brought PayPal into the mainstream and gave people a virtual wallet to both buy and sell. Now you've got Amazon who have not only stuff they're selling from Amazon warehouses, but you can sell stuff from Amazon and you can be a third party seller. So these people are taking advantage of the convenience that Amazon brought to them because of the overabundance of malls that were just deteriorating across the states. Amazon, eBay, and everyone in between, they didn't kill malls. They capitalized on the downfall. They saw what we're all just noticing now, that malls are dying. They noticed this incredibly early on and they made a ton of money off of it and they will continue to do so because this is an epidemic across the country and even throughout the world. I'm noticing on the Dead Malls of Discord server and on the subreddit that this isn't just happening in the States, this is happening across the entire globe.
The voice you heard in the opening sequence of this expedition log was that of famed Philadelphia area artist Zenos Frudakis, looking back on his time that he spent studying to create his first large sculpture commission. The piece was commissioned by Stockton Strawbridge to commemorate the 1982 grand opening of the Strawbridge and Clothier at the Burlington Center Mall. Mr. Strawbridge chose to name the piece The Waterhole. The sculpture depicts a young boy joyously riding on the back of an elephant. And while in operation, the elephant's snout would gently pour water in the air, falling down its sides. In the years leading up to the mall's grand opening, Mr. Frudakis would spend time at the Philadelphia Zoo playing with and studying the behavior and anatomy of three elephants that the zookeepers allowed him access to. One in particular was a beautiful African elephant named Petal. She was a sweetheart, and according to Mr. Frudakis, she would act like a puppy. She would suck on his shoes and clothing with her snout, and she would play and jump and frolic around him. He studied her skin, muscles, and structure, and spent ample time with her. The Museum of Natural History in New York also allowed him access to the skeleton of Jumbo the Elephant, who was the beloved friend and showman of the P.T. Barnum Circus for many years. Mr. Frudakis named the elephant in the statue Petal. Zeno sculpted an utterly joyous 10-year-old little boy on Petal's back, only based on his understanding and study of the human anatomy, with no model. I think he nailed it. When Zenos was studying Petal for the sculpture, she was a mere 24 years young. She spent her entire life making children and adults happy at the Philadelphia Zoo, and she retired gracefully in 2006. She spent her final years resting comfortably at peace and in wonderful care. And in 2008, she died at the age of 52 years old. Her memory lives on forever with the bronze statue, which was up until March of 2019, sitting mostly forgotten within the abandoned, desolate, ill-managed Burlington Center Mall. However, in April, it was announced that Petal will be receiving a new forever home. The Frudakis family campaigned to get her out. The owners actually donated the sculpture to an arts guild. However, they needed to raise funds to restore Petal back to her original state. And once the restoration is complete, her forever home will be on the Burlington waterfront. And if you stick around through the end of the video, you'll see exactly where her forever home will be. And in a later episode, I plan to visit her after she's been placed. In 2006, the Strawbridges dissolved into Macy's, to which the store was converted. And then in 2010, the Macy's shuttered, and that entire wing slowly became abandoned, and Petal got more and more lonely each day. We love Petal. Petal's awesome. Petal got me into dead malls. So thanks, Petal. I owe you one. In 2012, Moonbeam Capital Investments, LLC of Las Vegas bought this ailing mall for 3.4 million bucks, according to their CEO, Steve Maxson. This was the beginning of the end for Burlington, the minute Moonbeam took over.
Moonbeam actually announced a $230 million renovation project that would turn them all into this really awesome town center, but it never came to be. We're going into the Sears right now, and this was the last thing to remain open. I didn't want to spend much time in this Sears because it was incredibly hot. It was abnormally hot because the inside of the mall was so cold, and I felt like something was wrong. I just felt like something weird was happening inside this Sears as we were in here. So we looked around, we got to see some stuff, we went and saw the graffiti in the garage. But again, the biggest thing was how incredibly hot it was, because it felt like they had the heat pumped up so high. And I've experienced this before. I experienced this at the Century 3 Mall, where parts of the mall were incredibly cold, and then other parts of the mall were incredibly hot, almost purposefully so to create an imbalance in the temperature. So in 2018, it was incredibly cold outside, and at the Burlington Center Mall, there was a burst water pipe. And because of this, they decided to close the mall. Moonbeam shut the mall down after a water main break. And when I was at this mall, something weird happened. We were finishing up inside, getting the last couple shots, getting our last bit of B-roll, and then we needed to leave to go film the interview. We were gonna do it in the parking lot. So I got to see Petal one last time. And we said our goodbyes. And we left them all. Sakes, Junior. You know, quite a few of those are probably mine. Did you already do the interview? Huh? Did you already do the interview? No, she wants to just in the parking lot. Um. <laughs> They wanted to film the interview right in front of the mall. So they set up their gear, and we started the interview. The minute the camera started rolling, we started hearing an alarm go off. So Anthony, Jr., from Faded Commerce, he took off running to go find out what was going on. The interviewer and I started surveying the perimeter to see if we could find anything of interest. So we looked around here, looked at this side of the Sears, there was nothing going on here. Then we climbed up this grassy knoll, and as we got closer, I saw Junior in the distance running towards me, and he was screaming. Something was going on. We actually witnessed 
a live water main break at a Moonbeam owned mall. Wave him down, June. I had no words. I didn't know what to say. There's a bad water main break in this place. Okay, this happened last year too. Yeah, that's why they closed it. There's a maintenance guy in there. I don't know what he's doing. I thought he was just setting an alarm or something because we just we just walked out of the building and walked. Yeah. The maintenance man walked us out and then three seconds later we hear the dog I'm like, oh, he's did set the alarm right. No, that wasn't the real alarm. There was a water main break at Century 3. That closed. There was a water main break here. It closed. There was a water main break at Shopping Town Mall in Syracuse. It's not doing well. It's probably going to close. These were all Moonbeam owned malls. I'm not saying anything except I see a trend. And the trend is scary. This anchor, again, was the Strawbridge and Clothier. Original anchor, never renovated. They converted into a Macy's in 2006, but they closed just four years later in 2010. So the inside of this place hasn't been seen in detail in nearly 10 years. But mall staff let us in after the water main break, after the interview, they let us back in to see it one last time. But again, it was getting dark. This was the only opportunity we would have to see the inside of the abandoned Strawbridge and Clothier turned Macy's. Now this mall has never received a renovation, ever. Not one. Yes, there's been maintenance, but there's never been a renovation. All of the malls around it have all been kept up over the years and brought into modern times. Moorestown, Cherry Hill, Voorhees, all of these malls have been modernized.
This mall just sat here since 1982. Look at this place. It's so sad. As we walk around here, you're going to see a lot of broken glass. And in any other mall, I might assume that it's vandalism. But nothing inside of here has been vandalized. It's in pretty pristine condition. Not withholding what Mother Nature has done to it so far. It's awfully rare to get this kind of unrestricted access and permission into an abandoned mall with the kind of celebrity that Burlington Center Mall has had within the dead mall community. When Dan Bell first visited this mall and produced his video, it took the community by storm and everybody instantly fell in love with Petal, including me. It's such a strange phenomenon to fall in love with a mall based on an inanimate object. I was so enamored by this place because of Petal. And in a few seconds here, you're gonna get a really rare view of the waterhole from within the old Strawbridge. Yeah, I'd love to party inside this mall. Take a look inside the all entrance at this view of Petal. Nobody will ever see this because at this point, she's gone.
Memphis Macy's. When Grandpa McMahon used to take Little Eddie to Macy's, and Little Eddie jumped up on Santa's lap. We're standing in Macy's, the largest department store in the world. All those huge balloons for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade going off to Macy's. Macy's. Only one star has been a part of your life for 150 years. The Dead Malls community has grown leaps and bounds over the years since I first started this series. As I explore more places and as the community grows, I grow more and more fond of the people in it. When I first started exploring with Anthony Jr. from Faded Commerce, he was like a kid, he was like a puppy as he was walking around these places. But he's really grown and his production quality and his content have grown too, so please go and check out Faded Commerce. Anthony and Paula do a great job over there. Here's another incredibly rare view of that forest green carpet and the arch for the Strawbridges with the sandblasted or laser etched, I'm not sure, logo at the top there. That crest is incredible. But this anchor has seen way better days. In February of 2019, after the mall was shuttered, Clarion Partners, who are a real estate developer from Dallas, they bought the mall from Moonbeam for $22 million. 22 million bucks for this property. Clarion builds warehouses. That's what they're known for. And they proposed a mixed use development for this, but the township turned it down. And we don't really know what they want to do with this yet. But if you want my guess, they're definitely going to open a warehouse here. It's just a matter of time. Is this one safe? I mean, I guess I can take this one. It's all tough looking. Come on. Come on. As we're finishing up the tour inside of this nearly 10 years abandoned anchor, I want you to just listen to the floor because it was so unstable as we were walking around. This is us just looking for the exit because everything was dark and one of our torches died at this point. So we're just looking for the exit. Nope, over there, that's it. We eventually found the exit and concluded our tour of the abandoned Burlington Center Mall, which is probably the last view we'll get in this depth of the mall before it's torn down. So we decided to FO because the guy that let us in wasn't there anymore. I actually called him to let him know that we were leaving right after I stopped filming and I had Junior close the door, make sure it was locked, and that was that. Community support saved a beloved piece of art left behind in a shuttered South Jersey mall. This is the sculpture called the water hole. It spent three decades at the Burlington Center Mall. When the mall closed, the owner donated it to the Arts Guild of New Jersey and the Burlington Rotary Club and others raised funds to move the sculpture. Petal the elephant is now heading to the Burlington City River Walk. All right. Petal. All right. I couldn't end this episode without showing you some hope because that mall is in such dire condition and it's going to be demolished. I wanted to show you the peaceful, calm, beautiful area that Petal will spend the rest of her years. This place is about to be renovated because the concrete is actually eroding into the river. Look at this, she's got friends now. 
this awesome eagle, and there's other statues around here that she'll be friends with. And there's kids running around the park and families there, people enjoying the waterfront, and everything is just calm. It's like a retirement community for a beloved artifact, which Petal is. And it warms my heart. It makes me so happy to finally bring this arc to a close. Because when I first met Petal, I only got to see her for a minute, and security escorted me out. And then I was able to communicate with the Frudakas family, and I grew to love Petal more. And it just made me so sad to learn that she was just stuck in there, abandoned. But she found a forever home, and this is it. I'd like to thank all of you for watching this video. Thank you to all of my patrons, to the Demos of Discord community, and Anthony from Faded Commerce. There's a ton more content coming, and I'll have episode 41 out very soon. So stay tuned for that, and make sure you guys subscribe and like, and ring that bell to be notified of future content. You guys all rock. Thanks again, and have a fantastic day to all of my Flinners.